it out loud. I'm going to put you on the spot. Who made Baby Slayton cry? That's what I want to know right now. <laughs> Go ahead. Who is you? What? <laughs> no, wasn't you? All right. <laughs> Oh, he's pointing to Brother Offenberger. Now, Brother Offenberger, <laughs> some, some of y'all have been around long enough to remember that he would sit on the platform up here. And I, one of the first times I was here, maybe the first time, and of course, I don't walk quite as much as I used to. I still walk around, but used to be, I'd be back and forth and all that. And he's sitting on the platform, and you know, when he crosses his legs, one leg just stays out straight. <laughs> and so I'm preaching a while, and I come over here, and I'm preaching a while, and I come back over here, and I'm preaching a while, and the leg's sticking right there. I've forgotten all about it. And so I came down one time, and came. I was coming back up this side, and all that was here was a leg. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a collective gasp of over the auditorium. Everybody's kind of holding their breath just a little bit, because nobody knew whether I was going to try to jump it, or turn around. And everybody was relieved when I turned around and went the other way. It's been a long time I ain't a preacher. We've been through a whole bunch together, and so we're, uh, we're excited to see him tonight. Thank you so much for being here. It's always an honor and a privilege. We had a, uh, we had a wonderful time at the funeral meal. And I think that I, I just love to see when a church is filled with compassion and reaches out to a hurting family. That was wonderful. And uh, your pastor's already complimented you and told you, but from someone who, uh, again, I hate to throw around numbers, who's been in over 1,100 churches, it's a nice thing to see that much compassion and love and effort poured out on one family uh, that's hurting. Go ahead, open your Bibles, please, to the book of Exodus tonight. The book of Exodus, we're going to give Elisha a break, at least for tonight. Go to the book of Exodus. We're going to be in the 14th chapter here in a few moments in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 14. While you're finding your place in the Word of God, let me give you a little background of this passage of Scripture. There are so many things that go on in our world that everybody has their own opinion about them. You can watch the same exact news footage. You can see the same exact events unfold. And people would have completely different interpretations or perspectives about those things. Some of us watched what happened in Seattle and in Portland, and we said those are riots. And we saw the video of buildings burning and things like that. We said those are nothing but riots. Other people saw those exact same things and said, no, no, those are peaceful protests. There are some that saw what happened on January the 6th in our capital, and they say, well, that, that was just an insurrection trying to take over our government. And others would say, no, no, that's their peaceful protest, and that's their right to do so. And there, we saw the same exact thing, but based upon your particular perspective, you interpreted it completely differently. In this passage of Scripture, everybody involved in Exodus chapter 14 saw the same exact thing. Everybody saw the same things unfold. They saw the same miracle take place. They watched it with their own eyes, and yet they would have had completely different perspectives about what they were watching. Let's assume that we could take just for a moment. We have three chairs up here. And we're going to put in this chair Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of the nation of Egypt, the most powerful man at this point in time on the entire planet Earth. In the middle seat, we're going to put Mr. Moses himself. And in this seat, we're just going to pick by random any member of the nation of Israel. Remember what's happened so far. God has stretched out his wonders. He has smitten Egypt with those ten plagues. And finally, the children of Israel have left the land of Egypt and are working their way toward the eventual promised land, that place that was promised by God when he said, I will bring them up out of the land of the Egyptians and deliver them up out of that land unto a good land and a large and a land flowing with milk and honey under the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites. We know that this is going on, and as they're moving along, the very first place that Moses takes them is a terrible place. Remember this historically. We look at the nation of Israel today as a nation. When they went into the land of Egypt, they were not a nation. They were a family. It was the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Everybody that went into Egypt with Jacob was a member of his family in one way or another. But now after the time of sojourning in Egypt and then the time of captivity, their population has grown so much 
that it has made Pharaoh actually afraid. He actually says, well, if an enemy attacks us from the outside, the children of Israel could join them on the inside, and Egypt could be overthrown. That's why he decided to kill the uh, male babies when they were born. And now as they come out of Egypt for the first time, they're a nation. For the first time, they have a leader. They haven't had a leader before. They would have looked up to Joseph, but again, they were all Joseph's family. But now they have a leader. And the very first thing that Moses does as he leads them out of the land of Egypt is put them in a place that they can't get out of. He puts them in a place where they can't go forward, they can't go to the left, and they can't go to the right. And if we ask Pharaoh what he saw on that day, he would say, this is what I saw. I came up with all of my armies and all of my chariots and all of my chosen chariots. My goal was to annihilate and to destroy the nation of Israel. He did not want to take them back to be captives again. He wanted to kill them. He wants to exert his wrath. God has hardened his heart toward the nation of Israel one more time. And now he's coming up behind them. He said, as he came up behind them, I noticed where they were. And I thought to myself, they have been swallowed up and they have been shut in in this wilderness. They can't go forward because the Red Sea is in front of them. They can't go to the right because the mountain range of Pihahiroth is there. They can't go to the left because the mountain range of Migdol by the sea and the mountain peak of Belsihon is there. And now I have got them completely bottled in with innumerable numbers that outnumber them in every single way. And then all of a sudden, just when I thought we were going to destroy the nation of Israel, all of a sudden the waters of the Red Sea begin to bubble. And I noticed that all of a sudden there was a wall of water on the right and a wall of water on the left and dry land from one side to the other. And I saw the children of Israel walk into the Red Sea on dry land. That's what Pharaoh saw. That's exactly what he would say if he were sitting here, if he were on a witness stand. That's what Pharaoh saw. If we ask the children of Israel, what did you see? They would say, well, here we were. We were finally delivered from our bondage. We've been crying out by reason of our taskmasters. And Moses came along and told us God was going to deliver us. And those ten plagues, at the end of those ten plagues, Pharaoh said, all right, you can go. And as we left, and Moses led us immediately to a place that we couldn't get out of. It seemed like it was a pretty nice place to camp with Pihahiroth on one side, with Belsifon and Migdol by the sea on the other. And there we were. We could wake up every morning and look out over the beautiful waters of the Red Sea. But then we felt the ground begin to quake. And we began to hear the stomping of feet. And we turned around. And off in the distance we could see the, the dust billowing as Pharaoh with all of his chariots and all of his chosen chariots and all of his captains of his chariots and all of his armies showed up. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know what was going to happen next. But all of a sudden, the waters of the Red Sea began to bubble. And all of a sudden, we saw a wall of water on the right and a wall of water on the left. And dry land from one side to the other. We marched straight into the Red Sea. That's what the children of Israel saw. We asked Moses, Moses, what did you see? He would say, well, the Lord told me to camp the children of Israel. On one side by Pihahiroth, on the other side by Bel Sifon and Migdol by the sea. He told me to camp right in front of the Red Sea. And then he told me he was going to go back and harden the heart of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was going to come after us. There we were standing there completely bottled in with here came all the armies of the of Pharaoh. And all the chariots and all the chosen chariots and all the captains of the chariots behind us. All of a sudden, God told me to turn around and hold my rod out over the water. And God parted the water with a wall of water on the right and a wall of water on the left and dry land from one side to the other. Everybody involved in this passage of Scripture saw the same thing. Whether they believed that God even existed, whether they trusted Him implicitly like Moses did, or whether they were constantly doubting Him like the children of Israel were, they all saw the same thing. But they all interpreted it completely differently. Right. Look at people in Exodus chapter 14. Begin with me in verse 1. We'll read a couple of verses and skip down for sake of time. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, over against Belsifon. Before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land, the wilderness hath shut them in, and I 
will harden Pharaoh's heart, but he shall follow after them. Now skip down please to verse 8 because the fulfillment of that takes place. <coughs> and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them in camping by the sea beside Hirah before Belsiphon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. They were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of, the, out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt? Saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today for the Egyptians, whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speakest unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Skip down, please, to verse 29. I want you to see the end of the story, please. Verse 29 says this, But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Then sang Moses, now watch, and the children of Israel, this song unto the Lord. And spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously the horse and the right, and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he hath become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. They were his chariots and his hosts that he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also were drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. I want to preach you a message simply entitled tonight, It's All in Your Perspective. There are people in this auditorium with all three perspectives from this passage of Scripture. Those that do not know Christ as your personal Savior, you're going to look at things just like Pharaoh looks at them. You're going to see that Pharaoh's viewpoint always ends up in failure. There are some in this auditorium, you look around and you see all that the world is doing and all that the flesh and the devil is doing, and you're scared to death because you have the viewpoint of the children of Israel. But there's a few that look at a trial like Moses looked at it. When Moses looked at the Red Sea, people will say Moses saw the waters parted before they even happened. That's not the truth. Moses did not know how God was going to deliver but Moses just knew God was going to deliver. Mm -hmm. And a child of God should know for sure that whatever trial and tribulation comes along, that in one way or another, God is always going to deliver. Yeah. Whether he parts the water, or whether he levels the mountain, or whether he wipes out the, uh, the Egyptians, God is always going to deliver. Let's have a word of prayer before we preach a message on its all in your perspective. Dear Lord, <coughs> Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for our time together where we pray that you'll bless the message tonight. Help Mrs. Harper over with the kids in the kids' club and help them to have a good time as they learn about your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But help us in this auditorium. Help us, Father, to decide what perspective we want to have. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to start with Pharaoh. I want you to see Pharaoh's perspective first and foremost. Pharaoh comes up behind the children of Israel. When he gets up to see the children of Israel encamp there with mountains on both sides and the Red Sea in front, and his armies have now bottled them in, what's the first thing he really sees when he sees the children of Israel? First thing he notices is this, an unarmed people. You realize the children of Israel, when they left the land of Egypt, remember this, 
They did leave with jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. They did loot, if you will, the children of Israel, uh, the, the Egyptians. They basically ransacked them. They left with money, if you will. They didn't go empty-handed. But they didn't take with them. They didn't attack the armory of the nation of Egypt. They didn't take all their swords and all their spears and all their shields and all their chariots. They didn't take any of those things. As a matter of fact, they also had been training for military service. If you're a if you're a slave owner, if you have an entire nation slave enslaved, you don't teach them how to destroy the slave owner. That's not how you do it, is it? The children of Israel aren't exercising every day. There might be some mighty men in the nation of Israel, some strong men, but they've not been training and learning military tactics and learning how to shoot bows and arrows. They haven't been practicing with swords and spears. The Egyptians had better sense than them. So when Pharaoh comes up behind them, they don't have, they might have found a sword somewhere along the way, a shield or a spear along the way, but certainly not enough to arm an entire nation. And Pharaoh has brought an entire army. He doesn't look at them in fear. He's not the least bit concerned about them. The best thing they can do is throw rocks and hit the Egyptians with sticks. They won't give, even get a chance to fight the Egyptians because the Egyptians are going to send arrows flying through the air and kill most of the children of Israel before the battle ever begins. Do you think Pharaoh and his soldiers and his generals sat around and said, Oh, what are we going to do? How are we going to defeat these unarmed children of Israel? you think they worry? Do you think Pharaoh is the least bit concerned? Do you think he's worried about the number of body bags he's going to take home with him? Do you think Pharaoh is even giving it a second thought when he looks ahead and sees the unarmed people? By the way, remember this. In the Word of God, Egypt is almost always a picture of the world. So when you look at Pharaoh's viewpoint, you're looking at the world's viewpoint. When you look at the children of Israel, you're looking at the people of God. And to draw the comparison, that's what the Christian is today. Just like Pharaoh wasn't afraid of the people of God because in his eyes they were unarmed. The world's not afraid of the church anymore, is it? Now some of you here that are my age or older, you remember this. You remember a time when if a politician wanted to do something in your county or in your town, the first people he wanted on his side were the Christians. He wanted the preachers to be on his side. He wanted to get the votes from those Christians that came to church. Nowadays, they don't look at us with any fear whatsoever. They make laws and rules and, and ordinances in spite of churches, not because of churches. No. Simple truth is, as you're sitting here, they're constantly trying to move into what we would call our territory. I remember years ago, I love to tell charity stories. My little daughter was so innocent at this point in time, traveling in evangelism, going to church every single night. She was about eight years old. We stopped in Dover, Delaware, and we went out to dinner after breakfast, I think it was, maybe it was lunch, with Pastor Terry Moore and his wife, Debbie. So it's me and Kimberly and Charity and Terry and Debbie, and we're sitting at the table. And Terry is talking about having to make the trip over to the the Capitol to to go and sit down and protest because they are trying to build an adult bookstore within 500 yards of a Bible-believing church. And so they're protesting. They've got petitions signed. And we're talking about this at the table. Just the four of us adults, Charity, sitting there, all silent, not saying anything at all. Finally, after hearing word after word after word, the same term, adult bookstore, adult adult bookstore, adult bookstore. Finally, Charity brought her hand down on the table like this, and she said, I hate that. I thought, oh, that's pretty impressive. She said, they're always talking about adult bookstores. Why don't they learn that if they built a kid's bookstore next to the adult bookstore, that the kids could be in a bookstore while the adults could be in a bookstore? That's what we realized. That Charity had no idea what an adult bookstore was. The truth of the matter is, they're constantly up against us now. They're constantly fighting us. They're constantly out to get us. They constantly demonstrate that they don't like us. And when they see us, they see an unarmed people, don't they? It does make sense that they see an unarmed people. Because think about this for just a moment. Our armor is invisible. Right. <laughs> you can't stand up and show me your breastplate of righteousness. 
Your loins are about with truth. Your feet are about with preparation of the peace. You can't show me your helmet of salvation. You can't show me any of those things. We're an unarmed people. Our armor is invisible. Not only is our armor inv- invisible, but our only offensive weapon is a book. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the dividing of the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Our only offensive weapon is a book, and above all, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6. Our flamethrower is a book, isn't it? He said, I will make my word in thy mouth a fire, and this people would, and thou shalt devour them. Our sledgehammer is a book. I will make my, my word in thy mouth a hammer, and, uh, and this pe- and that's up, I'm sorry, that's up, uh, break the rock in pieces. Over and over, the Bible describes this book as our only offensive weapon. It's the only thing we've got. And they don't like it, they don't respect it, they constantly want to change it. Don't you find it interesting that you've never seen anybody try to rewrite the Koran? Right, yeah. Yeah. You've never seen anybody try to rewrite the law code of Hammurabi. Yeah. You've never seen anybody try to rewrite any ancient text except the Word of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And even God's people want to rewrite it. That's right, yeah. mm-hmm. Even God's people want to say, well, we're just going to change a few words here and there. No one ever changes anything else. The only book they want to change is the book that they wanted to change since the beginning when Lucifer first utters in the garden, Yea, hath God said. Right, yeah. He sees an unarmed people. He sees the same thing, doesn't he, when Pharaoh comes up behind him? He sees an unseen protector. There's nobody there to stop him. See, Pharaoh worshipped a lot of gods with a small g. There was the God of the Nile. There was the God of the afterlife. There was the God of what they would call heaven. There were all kinds of gods. There were the gods of the crops. There was the gods of the cattle. And every one of those gods would have had an idol and a temple built to it. So Pharaoh is used to, when he wants to see the God of the Nile, he can lay his eyes on what he calls the God of the Nile. But these children of Israel, they're messed up a little bit, aren't they? The God that they worship... They can't even see him. No man has seen God any, at any time. No man has seen, can see God and live. Until Jesus comes, we don't really have a good viewpoint of him. But as he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He doesn't see a giant idol that they're carrying, a giant eagle or a giant lamb or a giant ram that they're carrying. Pharaoh might have been afraid of that just a little bit. But he's not afraid of an invisible God. But he doesn't realize that God is still there. We'll talk more about that in just a moment, but he can't see him. He doesn't know God is going to fight for the children of Israel. He sees an unarmed people and an unseen protector. There is nothing in this story that would scare Pharaoh. Nothing that would cause him pause. Nothing that would make him sit down and draw up battle plans. Nothing! He saw a third thing, though. He saw an unfettered path. You remember this now. Pharaoh saw... The Red Sea part. He saw God do this miracle. He saw dry land from one side to the other. And this was Pharaoh's logic. And maybe it's some of yours in this auditorium. If I look enough like the people of God, if I walk in the same footsteps of the people of God, if I walk the same path of the people of God, I can get to the other side without ever believing in God. There are a whole lot of people sitting in a whole lot of churches for services that think you can act like a Christian, if you look like a Christian, if you talk like a Christian, if you go to a couple church services like a Christian, if you maybe put a dollar or two in the offering plate like a Christian, if you impersonate a Christian, you can get from one side to the other without ever believing in God. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can look great on the outside. That won't take you to heaven. You can keep every commandment. That won't take you to heaven. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. Or Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. It's not of works, lest any man should pose. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 9. The simple truth of the matter is, you can look exactly like a Christian. You can come to this church or any other church more often than some Christians do. It still will take you to heaven. Looking like, acting like, and talking like a Christian 
just won't get you there. Standing up and telling someone, yep, I know I'm saved, that's not enough to take you to heaven. Never forget, years ago, we were a few, I think it was about four years ago now, we were in Okinawa, Japan, and we got there a little bit, uh, uh, a couple days later than we wanted to get there this time. And so we got off the plane, and, and what you do in Japan, this is, this is interesting, you'll like this, you find out where the convenience stores are. The convenience stores are absolutely incredible in Japan. You can get anything at a convenience store, and there's some things that we get almost every day at the convenience store. So uh, you walk from the church, you walk down a little narrow road, there's a couple apartments there, and they walked over a bridge, and then you made a turn on a, on a bigger road, a four-lane road, and then right across the street there was what's called a family mart. They all have English names uh, when they of their convenience stores. Not their other stores, but their convenience stores do. And so I walked over there, and I'm walking by this little section. It's a little residential area, and there's a lot of American military there. You know this. A lot of people serving in the American military. And this, and they had, this one house had all, what we would call a duck pond, or we used to call it that. It's a little backyard with a patio. And this is like the 2nd of November. And as I'm walking by, they have a decoration there. When you first see it, it caught your attention. What it was was a mannequin, but you didn't realize that when you first looked at it. The mannequin is laying face down up against the sliding glass door of the home. Inside the sliding glass door is the head of the mannequin. So that it looks like the sliding glass door severed the head of the mannequin. It was a Halloween decoration. There were bloody handprints going up the sliding glass door. I, for one, thought that was adorable. I thought that's just really cool looking right there. It caught my attention. Plus, it's still up on November the 2nd. I know some people have problems with Halloween and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, this wasn't any demon or anything like that. It's just a dead mannequin. And the mannequin was never alive in the first place. So I thought it was fun. And so I walked in the meeting store, walked back. The next day I walked with Kimberly, I pointed out. And she looked at it, and we laughed and joked about it. So for a couple more days, I was there preaching a Wednesday through a Sunday revival. And then staying to the next Wednesday... Uh, to preach one more time. I was going to preach in the Christian school Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then Wednesday night. And so on Tuesday, now I've been there over a week, I walked by, and what I was used to seeing every day wasn't there anymore. No longer is the mannequin there. No longer are the handprints on the glass. I look around. I actually was disappointed. I'd become used to seeing it and laughing at it. It brought a, a, a lighthearted moment to my day every day. And I turned around and looked and saw this man. He was of, of Filipino descent. And he is carrying a mannequin by its belt like this, just walking with it under his arm like that. And so I realized he's the only guy on the street carrying a mannequin. It was probably his Halloween decoration. And my deduction was correct. I ran up to him and I started talking to him for just a moment. Told him that I enjoyed seeing his decoration. I said, were you the only one decorated? He said, no, lots of people did. He said, I'm just the last one to take him down. It was like the 6th to the 7th now of November. And so we talked for a moment or two. And I said, he said, what are you doing here in Japan? Because, of course, Japan is filled with Japanese. And I'm obviously too old to be in the American military, so I'm not there. He is a Lance Corporal in the U.S. Marine Corps serving at Camp Foster there in Okinawa. And I told him I was a preacher, and I was going to preach Wednesday night. Remember, this is Tuesday. I was going to preach Wednesday night at Maranatha. And he said, I know where that is. I said, I'd love to have you come. If you come tomorrow night, I'll introduce you as my personal special guest. And he did this. I promise you, he went like that. It's kind of an unusual response. And then he said this. He said, I guess I have to come. That's not the answer you usually get, is it? <laughs> I guess I have to come. I said, well, what do you mean by that? Again, I told you his name was Angel. His wife's name was Maria. And he said, well, I just told my wife last night, he said, God has really been trying to get my attention. He said, about the only thing that hasn't happened is someone showing up out of the clear blue and inviting me to church. He said, I think I have to be there tomorrow night. When he said, I came and he wasn't there. So Thursday, the pastor, Pastor Novato, who is a retired gunny sergeant in the Marine Corps from the Philippines, and had served at the Marine Corps Air Station there in Camp Foster in Okinawa. So the two of us go out to visit. We knock on the door. This man's wife, Maria, answers the door. She's got all of the jargon down packed. She is also a Lance Corporal in the Marine Corps. And she's also of Filipino descent. You can tell by their names, Angel and Maria, 
that they have a Catholic background. I just stood by and I'm not going to talk. I mean, they have everything in common. I have nothing in common with any of them. So finally, after a few minutes, he's asked her, do you know for sure if you died, did you go, you'd go to heaven? She said, yes, I do. He talked to her a few minutes more, a few minutes more, nothing. She wasn't moving at all. So he was saying goodbye and, you know, well, we might come by and see Angel one day. And she said, that'd be fine. And I stopped and I said, ma'am, I said, I don't mean to insult you in any way. I said, but I have to ask you one question. I've just been saying that you're listening. I said, do you always lie to people like that? Now, I will tell you this from the bottom of my heart. She could have whooped me in an instant. There's not a question about it. She looked at me and she got her back up a little bit like we would say. She said, I don't lie. I said, well, I hate to disagree with you, but you did lie to Pastor just a minute ago. She said, when did I lie? I said, he looked you in the eye and asked you, do you know for sure if you died today you'd go to heaven? And you said, yes. She said, that's because I do. I said, do you really? She said, I do. I said, do I look like a priest? She said, no. I said, does he look like a priest? She said, no. I said, do you see a priest anywhere around here? She said, no. I said, so if you died right now, there's no priest here to administer the last rites, which is the seventh sacrament of the Catholic Church. And if you can't have that seventh sacrament, you cannot possibly, according to your religion, even go to heaven right now. You would go straight to purgatory, wouldn't you? She looked at me and she said, you know, you're right. I said, would you like to know how you can know right now? That if you did die, you could go to heaven no matter who was around. You know, she trusted Christ as her personal Savior that Thursday night. They, she and her husband were in church on Sunday. And within two weeks, her husband was in the choir singing in that church. I understand what I'm trying to tell you. You can stand up and say that you know for sure you're on your way to heaven. But if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, you're not going to heaven because no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And you might look at the path that the Christian is on and say, I see a wall of water on one side and a wall of water on the other. And I see dry land from one side to the other. I'm just going to follow in the Christian's footsteps. And some way, someday, that will get me to the other side. No, it will leave you drowned in the water every single time. Right. Right. Notice Pharaoh's viewpoint. Notice the two quickly the people's viewpoint. All those children of Israel, they seen the same thing. They saw the waters part. But when the armies of Pharaoh show up behind them, what's the first thing that they do? They become fearful. That's what the Bible says, does it not? And it's, they saw when they came up behind him in chapter 14 there, the first thing it says, when Pharaoh drew nigh, verse 10, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and all the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. Wouldn't you be afraid too? If all you have at your disposal is a rock, and here come the children of, Israel, uh, the children of Egypt with all of their swords and spears and shields coming up behind you, they were sore afraid. They looked at this army and they said, we cannot defeat this army. We don't stand a chance against this army. We're afraid. But see, the children of Israel shouldn't have been afraid, should they? Just like the church shouldn't be afraid today. You know what the children of Israel should have done? As they look back and they say, wow, that's a big army. Hold on. Let me check. <clears throat> yep. He's still there. I'm not worried about their army anymore. Remember, the children of Israel had something. We have the word of God, which tells us that he is with us and will never leave us or forsake us. But the children of Israel actually had a visible manifestation of the presence of God, did they not? Did they not have a pillar of cloud over them during the day and a pillar of fire over them during the night? Couldn't they just have looked up and said, hey, hey, I know they got a lot of people back there, but you know what? Last week that army would have been bigger, but God killed the firstborn of every one of their families. They should have looked up and said, you know what? I don't like their army. It kind of makes me a little bit nervous. But the one up there is the one that's never lost a battle. Our God is in the heavens, Psalms tells us. He hath done whatsoever He pleased. He's never been defeated. He's never been ambushed. He's never been outmaneuvered. He's never been outsmarted. There's never been an army with better armament than He has. He's never lost one single time. And as long as we're fighting on His side, we cannot possibly lose. Instead of being afraid, they should have looked up and said, Hey, good news, God's still there. Pharaoh doesn't know He's there. But the children of Israel should have known He was there. The world does not know who fights on our side. But we do. 
Why would we ever be afraid of them? Yeah. Why would they ever make our knees weak? Why would we ever look back and be so afraid? They were fearful. But also notice this. They were fatalistic. These are people that have been in bondage. These are people that have been slaves and now they're free. In the good old United States of America, we kind of understand that, don't we? We're not going to do and let anybody take our freedoms away, or at least we say we won't. Somebody tries to take our freedoms away, they're going to have a fight on their hands, aren't they? They're going to have a little bit of a problem on their hands. The simple truth of the matter is, these people should have said, all right, there's more of them than there are of us. But we don't have any swords or spears. But I'm just going to start throwing rocks. I've never been free my entire life, and now I'm free, and no Egyptian is going to take it away from me. I will die right here with a stick in my hand, taking every Egyptian I can with me. Isn't that what you and I would have done? At least we would think what they would do. That's not what the two of us will say. They said, weren't there no graves in Egypt? And they'll promise us for to die in the wilderness. Do you know what they're doing? They're waving a white flag and picking out their burial plots. They're fatalistic. They've already decided that they've lost. Forget that God is on their side. Forget that they have seen God turn water to blood, make the sun go black, and kill the firstborn of every family. That's not good enough for them. At the end of the at the end of this chapter, that's when they finally believe God. Don't you think you'd have believed God when you saw the Egyptians walking through frogs? Don't you think you'd have believed God when you saw the sun go black and the fire and brimstone fall? Don't you think that would have been a good time to say, you know, <laughs> I think he's up there. They're flawed. Now, they're fatalistic and they're fearful, but lastly, they're flawed. Watch what they say. Remember the symbolism as well. Egypt is a picture of the world. The children of Israel are God's people. Notice what they said, please, in verse uh, 12. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. They actually say it would be better for us to serve the world than to die for God. I would hope that is not the testimony of any person in this auditorium. But it has become the testimony of the church for the last 20 years. We are more interested in serving the world and gaining popularity than we are to standing and fighting, even if all we have is a stick and a book. That's why you have few pastors across our country who are looking up and seeing what the world is worth. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry, I'm not going to preach on this tonight, but there are youth pastors out there that say they're Swifties for Christ. The point of the matter is, that's why you have youth pastors, 300-pound youth pastors, wearing skinny jeans with holes in them. You want to see something scary? See a youth pastor in skinny jeans that weighs 300 pounds. That'll make you afraid right there. That'll bring you close to the foot of the cross right there. (laughs) We are more interested in being popular than we are righteous. We're more interested in being relevant than we are righteous. And by the way, what makes God's people relevant is not that we look like the world and act like the world and mimic the world. It's funny. The world used to want to mimic the church. Now the church wants to mimic the world. It's not that that makes us relevant. It's the fact that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That's what makes us relevant. Everybody else is trying to preach some other way to heaven other than the way, the truth, and the life. The relevancy is we have the gospel to share. Notice, number one, we saw Pharaoh's viewpoint. We saw the people's viewpoint. Number three, the patriarch's viewpoint. I realize you could easily write down the name Moses' viewpoint. And if you want to, that is fine. It just doesn't start with a P, so that's why it says patriarch. I'm just being transparent The patriarch's viewpoint. Here's Moses. Moses sees the Egyptians coming up behind him. He knows that God is going to win the battle here today. He knows that God is going to wipe out the Egyptians. He doesn't know how. So Moses looks back at the Egyptians where all the children of Israel are looking back. And he preaches a three-sentence message. I know some of you are actually saying, I sure wish Brother Harper had preached a three-sentence message. (laughs) 
Look verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not. He said, stand up. To put it more bluntly, he said, quit whining. Quit being afraid of those Egyptians back then. First Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit ye like men, be strong. We're supposed to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Yes. <coughs> Notice carefully, he says first, fear ye not. Stop being afraid of them. Again, he's looking back at the Egyptians. God, Moses does not know how God's going to kill the Egyptians. He just knows it's going to happen. Not just fear ye not, but then he says stand still. This is not talking about motion. You can stand still. That's not what he's saying. He says stand still. He said, quit whining and hush up. Mm -hmm. He said, stand still and stand up. Don't you love that verse? Be still. Mm -hmm. And know that I am God. Mm -hmm. Every now and then, Christian, we need to just hush. Yeah. And just listen. To the still, small voice that Elijah heard right. on that mountain. He said, stand, uh, stand up. He said, stand still. He said, stand amazed. He said, and see the salvation of the Lord. And then he tells them this. For the Egyptians, uh, for the Egyptians, whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. I think, honestly, Moses is waiting on lightning bolts to come down from heaven. The Lord to just pass over and kill all the Egyptians. I don't think he's looking, looking uh, for the waters of the Red Sea to part. God has to tell him what to do, doesn't he? It's not that Moses has his hand out over the water saying, See the salvation of the Lord. Moses is looking back at the Egyptians and said, Watch, God's going to kill them. Stand up, stand still, and stand amazed. Then God says, Why are you crying out to me? Won't you ride over the water? <laughs> Don't you think that there were a few people that looked at Moses and thought, Poor guy's lost it. <laughs> He's just holding that stick out over the water. You imagine the moment. You want to talk about a vilified miracle. You can tell how big a miracle this is because the world has vilified it for now 3,000 plus years. Right. Yeah. Oh, they crossed to the shallow place yeah. in the Red Sea. That's almost comical because they, God Almighty then held down every Egyptian soldier and their horses in shallow ankle deep water and drowned them all. Yeah. That's a bigger miracle than part no water to me, if you ask me. Oh, it wasn't the Red Sea, it was the Reed Sea. How, if it's shallow enough for them to walk across, how is it that Pharaoh's uh, horses uh, wash up on the seashore? Yeah. It just doesn't make sense. The fact is, they've been against this miracle for a long time. God all of a sudden parts the water, and there's their standing there. It's dry land. Right. Yeah. Not muddy. Yeah. Right. I have believed that it was paved. I can't prove that from Scripture, but I have believed it was paved. There's the roadway to righteousness right there. There's this avenue of faith, this pathway to peace, this gateway to glory right there. All they've got to do is walk across. I would have been one of those guys, I have to tell you, that I'm going to be doing this yeah. and feeling the water right there. Yeah. A wall of water on one side, a wall of water on the other side. Maybe some need to be reminded. You don't make walls out of water. It doesn't work that way. They get to the other side and here comes Pharaoh behind them. All of his armies and his chariots have been sent into the water. And when they all got in the midst of the Red Sea, God says, gotcha. And lets the waters close back up. You get to the end of the chapter, though. To me, this is so such an indictment of the children of Israel. They walk across with a wall of water on the left and a wall of water on the right. They go across on dry land. They get to the other side. Now watch what it says in verse 31. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did among the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord. Finally, and believed the Lord. They didn't believe when they walked out of Egypt. They didn't believe when Pharaoh's families lost their firstborn. I admit this is a huge miracle. I admit this is 
a breathtaking moment in human history. But don't you think they should have believed that? Amen. Yeah. And also, watch this, and believed, uh, and his servant Moses. Finally, they believed Moses. This man who has stood in front of Pharaoh time and time again for them, they never <coughs> believed him until right now. Now watch over them. So we saw Moses' viewpoint. He believed God could deliver before God delivered. He wasn't sitting there thinking, I wonder what God's going to do. I'm not sure God can do this. This is a pretty... No. Moses believed that God was going to deliver as soon as he turned around and saw the Egyptians coming up behind him. He doesn't know how, but he knows that God's going to do it. Children of Israel don't believe. They don't believe until they get to the other side and watch the water close up, close up over the Egyptians. And now Moses is going to get on the other side and sing a spontaneous song. Now, if you have, like I did at one point, a three or four or five year old little girl, I'm sure, I'm sure boys do this, but I can't speak with experience about boys. You can walk past her room sometimes and hear her writing her own song. I'm going to get up this morning and put on my princess dress, and then I'm going to have tea, and then I'm going to do. And they sing their own song. And it, it, it wouldn't make sense anyplace else but right there in her room to her. Right? Moses is going to do that here. Moses is going to make up his own song. It's not a Hebrew lullaby. No mother in the nation of Israel ever laid their little one-year-old down to go to sleep and said, Oh, God's going to kill a bunch of Egyptians one day. God's going to come out their horses. And the chariots going to wash up on the ocean. Yay, yay, yay. No, that's, that's not an old song. It's not one that they've sung all their lives. Moses is writing this as he goes through. Now watch what, this, what it says, though. Because it's not just Moses. <laughs> then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song. As Moses is making up this song, the children of Israel are singing it with him. Kind of sounds like for the first time, they have the same perspective. Yeah. Here's the problem, though, Christian. There are a lot of us that stand on that side of the Red Sea and watch Pharaoh's army drown and say, God is victorious. But there's only one that stood on this side and said, I don't know how he's going to do it. That's right. He didn't give me every detail of his plan. But I know God's going to be victorious. Which would you rather be, Christian? Hmm. The one that has to see a miracle before you believe? Yeah. Just like these children of Israel? Or the ones that believe that God can always do a miracle? I'd rather have Moses' viewpoint, wouldn't you? I'd rather have the patriarch's perspective and not the children of Israel's perspective. I'd rather not cower in fear to the world. I'd rather not be fatalistic or flawed. I'd rather just stand there and say, stand still. Fear not. And see the salvation of the Lord. I don't know how he's going to do it. But I know that every single time in his own way, he is always going to deliver. And it's time for God's people to have Moses' perspective. And God's people to say, I'm just going to trust him. He doesn't have to do a miracle for me to trust him. I'm going to trust him because I know he can do a miracle. Yeah, that's right. That's who we serve. You're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior. And you are doing your dead level best to impersonate a Christian. It'll never take you from this side to that side. It'll never take you to heaven. It's trusting him that does. If you're a Christian and you've got your own viewpoint, your own perspective, and you're flawed and fatalistic and fearful, it is time to just say, I want to be like Moses and just trust that God can always deliver. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. No one looking around. If we get bowed, every eye closed. You're sitting here today and you say, Brother Harper, I know I'm saved. I'm not impersonating or imitating a Christian. I know I've trusted Christ as my personal Savior. I know Jesus is my Savior and heaven is my home. And I know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Would you slip your hand up, please, all over the auditorium? Hold it high in the air. 
I'm just trusting His salvation to take me to heaven. Thank you. May I put your hands down? I didn't see any hands that didn't go up, but I might have missed. If you're not sure, there's time to take care of that tonight. There's time to get it settled before you leave. How many Christians would say, Brother Harper, I, I want to have that same viewpoint as Moses. I want to have the same viewpoint as Moses. I want to look at the problem and know that God is going to deliver. Would you slip your hand up, please, all over the auditorium? Thank you so much. You may put your hands down. And I apologize. I usually say, I'll, I'll give the pianist a signal. That's on me. That's not on her. Just a few moments, we're going to pray. After we pray, we're going to stand. And after we stand, the piano is going to begin to play. When you hear that first note of the piano, why don't you slip your, uh, step out of your seat? Don't be the person standing there looking at the dry path and not putting your feet in it. Do what the Lord's laid on your heart tonight. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Lord, we thank you for our time once again in your house. Lord, we ask that you bless this invitation. Have your will in your way. In Jesus' name. With your head still bowed, your eyes still closed, let's stand all over the auditorium. Everyone, please stand it. Just a second, you're the first note of the piano. Once you step out on that first note, if you step out on the first note, you don't give the devil two notes to talk you out of it. As she begins to play. A wonderful invitation song for the message. Only trust him.